Welcome to the second episode of the Scumbag Podcast Season 2. We already have one fatality as a result of this podcast. Vincent D'Onofrio quit Twitter not long after our recording. It speaks volumes of the quality and the mental damage that our podcast does. I do actually say, though, that Vincent is not mentally damaged by the podcast. He just genuinely came to it and i've been attacked by random fans ever since that's fun anyway he's not on this though pablo hidalgo of star wars ish stuff he's gonna tell you his title in a second hello pablo welcome to the show hey ed uh, now i'm picturing vincent on like full metal jacket scene and and i don't know what i'm getting into here (laughs) i quite like that idea (laughs) full metal log off fully oh my goodness Oh, God. So title-wise, uh, if I had business cards, it would say creative executive at Lucasfilm, but that's whatever. So I brought just- Pablo on to discuss, because he is part of what I would describe probably incorrectly, as I do with most things, as part of the kind of council of keeping Star Wars in one area. Obviously, you have to lead that with. He's not going to tell me like that Luke is actually... <laughs> a clone Luke or whatever, but nevertheless, we're to discuss fans and the mania of fans, which feels so, so right after accidentally getting a beloved film star to quit Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just in terms of uh, it, and it doesn't have to be star Wars. Cause like I'm yeah. a fan of multiple things, but just seeing how uh, that whole world has really accelerated and changed over the last few years. Thanks to, you know, our good friend Twitter. Yeah, it's weird how it's progressed from the almost nice days of BBS. Well, I don't know if you call them nice, but message boards. There was something inherently a bit nice about them, a bit insular. It was a a genteel age back then, you know. Yeah. (laughs) There was proper etiquette and you would, you know, you, you you would put on your Sunday bests. And uh, and log on to your bulletin board. And, and take it way and, too know, seriously. Have... Yes, of course. <laughs> I remember I used to post this like Final Fantasy one, and everyone used to get in that really deep, meaningless arguments about the minutiae of a game that had been out for a decade and just well, argue, argue themselves silly. And it's really interesting to see how much of attention spans have uh, changed because I remember when we... like you know, how much you would post on a bulletin board post or a forum post and the, and the length of those posts. And now 280 characters in Twitter feels like a, feels like a slog. Yeah. I think it's the natural just pain of tweeting the suffering <laughs> we all go through. <laughs> well, it's, it's, well, where did you use the post though? Where were your original homes? Uh, you know, at, when I first came online, I, I went on Usenet way back in the day, probably against my better judgment. Uh, and that's you know, you, you find your your you find your tribes there, and uh, you get sucked into it, thinking incorrectly that none of that stuff will ever, you know, remain online because it's it's often some weird ether that, of course, nothing that I've ever posted on Usenet is going to come back. Yeah, but at least you weren't one of those people who were actually committing crimes with children on using that. That was the weird thing. That that was the first time I ever remembered the internet having ramifications for real life. When I saw random news stories, it's like, this pedophile was on Usenet. I was like, Dad, what's Usenet? And he said, you know exactly, it's just what you were using on CompuServe. And I said, oh, God, no. And he, my dad genuinely asked me, like, did, did you ever talk to any older men? I said, no, I don't know who anyone was. It's like, good, good. Please tell me if that happens. So that was a great introduction to the internet for me, come to think of it. It's really strange to think about it because at the same time, like you could argue that things have gotten more hostile back then. Like there was absolutely, it felt like anything could happen. Like there, there was... At least now when people are being <laughs> – when people are, are, are transgressing and doing bad things, they kind of know that they're doing it. Yeah. Like, you know, back then it was, you know, it was just genuinely awful people being 
being uh, awful, but they weren't trolling just for it, it was you know irony hadn't been invented. I think <laughs> <laughs> the invention of irony does sound like a really shit film, but yeah, it, it's, it is true. I mean, these days you'd see a they had their own little forum police. I feel that mm-hmm. that doesn't really. In fact, Twitter doesn't even police itself, let alone the people on it. But right, what I've noticed is there's this weird. There is this innate hostility. You look at the Marvel movies. You look at how there's this weird over positivity and this completely polarized version where people are just like, "It's the worst thing." Black Panther, <laughs> I've not seen yet. I hear it's very mm-hmm. good. It's quite good. And but my God, it's just on what I don't want to see it on some level because I'm afraid I won't like something. Right. Well, and you're afraid you'll say the wrong thing in public to the wrong people, it's and then right, your phone will blow up. Else. But <laughs> no, but I mean, you've probably seen it within the various Marvel properties. There is this weird defensiveness, but. There's this other defensiveness where it's this is the good brand today, and I feel that Black Panther yeah. is definitely that. And but even before that, there were other things where just you can't insult this. And the last mm-hmm. Jedi, I know we can't probably discuss in detail anything specific, but I saw a version of that. I saw it happen with Captain America two, but not Captain America three. It's as if mm-hmm. someone. I would love to see the big board where someone assigns what you can dislike or not dislike, <laughs> but it seems certain things you can't hate. No, and then there are lines drawn, and and there's like there's certain things you can't like either. Um, well, what examples have you thing. seen of that? Because that's what I really enjoy. Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing. It's like I, 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 on some level, I could I empathize with uh, the DC fans, yeah, because they they've been so hopeful for so long that something uh, is going to come out of uh, what started with Man of Steel and all that. And but all objectivity kind of gets thrown out the window, so you can't even say, "Well, I kind of like this part." <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> because then you get lumped into the that particular tribe. Why well, quite enjoy- the thing that. No, go ahead. The thing, the thing that really strikes me is, uh, you know, it, it's a function of Twitter because you're not, you're not contained within a community. You're, you're broadcasting to the world, and, and so be it, right? But the amount of unsolicited feedback <laughs> that you get, um, I went, I was joking to, uh, uh, our, you know, pixelated boat um, yeah. about a, a scene I could imagine in a movie where there's two characters that are in the dark and one of them has fallen into a pit, but the other doesn't know where, like, let's say that's a woman. The woman has fallen into a pit. The other one doesn't know where she is, but he does know that her phone works, but he actually (laughs) doesn't know her phone number. Right. So what he does is, um, you know, he knows she has her notifications on. So if he finds her phone, she'll, he'll find her. So basically he just tweets and he tags her in a tweet that says, you know, Batman versus Superman wasn't very good. Oh. And then just basically her phone starts buzzing throughout the rest of the night for the next eight hours because of everyone who needs to, to pile on to that one tweet to offer ex- lengthy explanations as to why that's that's not true. I really, I I think that there is a certain, I, we talk about irony poisoning. Mm-hmm. I think there is an internet poisoning when it comes to real life because as I've, I'm becoming a father at the end of March, I'm becoming a, a real person, I guess. My child will not know what being online is like until he's at least three months old. And I, as a result, I spend more time around my wife's family and her. Mm-hmm. So not extremely online people. And as a result, I find myself liking more things. I, will, I want... The way- <laughs> The way it used to be. Yeah. I watched Suicide Squad and it's a bad movie, but it was fun in how I remember enjoying movies that people talk about incredibly positive, like Commando or even Predator. Oh, yeah. They're shit films yeah, yeah. when you watch them now. They're not good, <laughs> but they're really. Right. Suicide Squad was com- comedy bad. It was comedically awful. Like the Joker, sure. the whole time you could. It was also really fun watching that film and imagining that they never gave him lines. He just had to. <laughs> he's like a really bad improv guy. He's just like, 
Yeah. Like, uh, fuck it. Just let him talk. Let him go. <laughs> he doesn't have any idea what's going on. But that was, the, like, I enjoyed that. Man of Steel was objectively bad. And I really don't even know, even when I switched to normie brain, how I'd enjoy that. But I quite enjoyed Suicide Squad on this sort of dumb shit angle that it was dumb. And I feel like yeah. if I tweeted that, and probably after hearing this, people will attack me. They'll be like, oh, you're an idiot. Fuck it. Enjoy bad. But then the other day, this is how insane things are. I watched Guardians of the Galaxy 2 for like the 17th time. I said it was good. And so I was yeah. like, well, it's boring, actually. And I just, <laughs> at that point, I just went, what the f- I get not loving it like I do. I get not trying to legally marry your Blu-ray like I did. But I don't understand how you could just be virulently hateful. And I'm a hateful well, he- person. <laughs> you definitely see it because we're, we're we're just coming out of the Oscars just aired yeah. last weekend, and and you you get like the instant uh, you know people who had absolutely no opinion of Shape of Water oh, yeah. instantly now now need to you know I have- make sure everyone knows one side or the other what and especially like when it comes out of negativity it seems like so odd because it's it's uh, you know let it have its moment but at the, at the same time you see those editorials going on like the. What is it? The Freaks of One or something? No, I don't even know. <laughs> I've not even seen Get Out, and I feel like I should. Oh, that's that's a good one. But it feels like a film I shouldn't see if I'm tired. Yeah, no you you want to give it its you want to give it its due. Yeah, it looks like a really good film, but that's the thing. I'm worried about having the wrong opinion. You Always. know what? That's you know. I I think I think what you're talking about. I think film review is come is coming from the wrong place it's not telling it shouldn't be uh whether or not it's good it's bad it's like what level of tired is okay to watch this? yeah that's actually i wish that there was a correspondent who he he or she <laughs> valued the movie based on how awake you have to be to enjoy it and what right. level of awake and some enjoyment <laughs> Because I feel like exactly. Suicide Squad, if you were strapped into the machine from A Clockwork Orange, you wouldn't enjoy quite as much. No, no. And, you know, I, I used to do a, a podcast with some friends of mine, and they're still doing it called uh, – uh, it came from the depths of Netflix. Yeah. And because we, what we do is we just try to find the weirdest one-star movies that were out there and watch it. And, and we came to the realization that there is an actual quality – uh, of a movie that it gains if you're able to recommend it. Hey, watch this with friends. Well, that's it. Reminds me actually of a guy who's I think he's still on Twitter as uh, at Villainous Fats. This guy called Mike Finley, and he came up with an amazing scoring system for movies: the minus mm-hmm. four to plus four system. Okay, because he fundamentally believed there were minus four and minus three movies that were fundamentally good, bad. They were not okay marvelous but they were good mm-hmm. yeah and they're they're totally worth watching and like i said you know there's there's certain movies that if you watch it alone it's kind of a sad thing but if you watch it with the right group of people and you and you're looking to have a good time it's totally enjoyable well, what's an example of one of those because i'm i'm now naturally unable to bring up one on the spot well i'm just a Pulling from the podcast that we did, I think a couple of years ago, there was a Netflix movie called um, uh, "Cowboys versus Dinosaurs." Okay, and it is like just like a cheap, barely any effort put into it, uh, direct video one star movie oh, on yeah. on uh, on on Netflix. But I'll be damned if I did not cheer at a particular moment in that movie because it was like it was one of those things like where you're leaning forward, you're leaning forward, and you're like, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And the character does something spectacular involving a dinosaur, and you just like you pump your fists in the air because regardless of the movie's um, inability to 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 deliver high quality entertainment, it is doing its darndest to entertain you. Yeah. In it on you know in its own way, and because I was watching with a bunch of friends who appreciated that, it, it just magnified and elevated that moment. Right. Whereas if I were you know you know if if you're on if you're alone, it's two a.m. You're in your underwear and you're just watching that. And there's no one else in the house. It's it, it it paints a much sadder picture. Yeah, I I think that there is also because there's two levels. There's the internet value, simulcrum. That's probably not the word, but I'm going with it. 
where they so, attribute way too much value to things. Then there's the external real life too much value that I put movies like La La Land, which I right. thought was genuinely one of the most painful things. I have had bowel movements after bad curries <laughs> that were more pleasant <laughs> than watching that. Yeah. But I want to make people who love that movie watch like Cannonball Run. Just another bad yeah. movie that everyone likes. They need to watch every bad movie or every movie <laughs> I arbitrarily have said is bad because no one can disagree with me. But then there are movies sure. like Gamer, which there is a movie that pisses me off in is the sense Ger- that, Who's in that one? Is that Gerard, Gerard Butler? Butler, uh, Michael C. Hall, yeah. ludicrous. And it pisses me off <laughs> that everyone doesn't like it. Everyone's like, it's a stupid movie. <laughs> it's by the crank director. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's simultaneously a two and a minus two. It's <laughs> it has a scripted dance scene to Under My Skin with Michael C. Hall and a bunch of nanotech up guards. It's it's a marvelous. It genuinely is like a ninety three minute bam, bam, bam. You're done. Yeah. And I miss when people actually liked things like that because that's the thing that I feel people based on their tweets should like. But what they actually like is Frasier, for some reason, <laughs> and every Coen Brothers movie. Right, right. Well, because those are more, well, I don't know about Frasier, but I, th- those all instantly become more important kind of thing. But, you know, the, what you just said, it, like to me, if you have that minus four to positive four scale, uh, delivering a movie around the 90 minute mark should instantly get you like two points. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's yes. a lost art. That is a lost art. And that's why Gamer is so good. I bring up Gamer specifically because it is, I'm going to bring it up on IMDb because I'm a professional. I'm doing this as we are actually recording the podcast. Sure. And it is a beautiful hour and 35 minutes, 95 minutes. Exquisite. That that is perfect. That's a perfect Mm. length. Some movies can go over it. A certain Star Wars movie I will not name goes over (laughs) it in my mind, to a negative level. But you look at, like, mm-hmm. Taken, Aaron 33, Dumb and Dumber, Aaron 47, a little bit long, still great. Thank right, you for smoking. Right. Aaron 32 minutes. Like, great movie. I believe, uh, I believe Transformers Age of Extinction is the same length as Bridge on the River Kwai. <laughs> and they're ostensibly the same movie. <laughs> I, find- well, I, I think that's yeah but they're both it's the most david lean of the transformers movie <laughs> i would love it if they, that's the only way they could make those films worse is if alec guinness was in it <laughs> like they did a fake alec guinness the computer generated alec guinness oh, as, as the U- estate just as you the estate just needs the estate just needed the money for whatever yeah. reason so they just they, they make will- him a giant robot with pendulous orbs hanging from no, here's how you make it worse. Unfortunate places. You make it Unicron <laughs> uh-huh. because Awesome Wales did that. And then you have oh my God. someone doing an impression of Alec Guinness doing an impression of Awesome Wells, and it would just be mm-hmm. the worst thing ever. Michael Bay would sit there going, it sounds just like Arsene Holes, and they have no <laughs> idea. He thinks it's Arsenio <laughs> Hall because he's a racist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you remember this Bumblebee, the racist the racist. Oh. Um, uh, and I just yeah. like, like sounds just like Arsenio Hall, you know, the British black guy. No, no, Michael. Well, we already paid for him. Who did we pay? <laughs> oh, it was just me. So I gave myself more money. But there you go. further your theory, mm-hmm. your, it's yours now. I gave it to you. The Nice Guys, one okay. of the best movies the last two years. Aaron, thirty three minutes, bloody perfect. Yeah. There you go. I, a guilty pleasure movie, and I don't even like using that phrase. But there was a movie that came out in two thousand eight called Doomsday. Oh, uh, I never saw it. That's the Malcolm McDowell one? <laughs> yeah, we're directed by Neil, Neil Marshall. And it's oh. one of these movies that uh, it was it, a friend of mine, a man and a friend would, would see movies every weekend back then. I don't yeah. know what, what would change, but we just would. And whenever there was a trailer for something that, like it was a trailer for something that none of us had ever heard of, and the trailer said it was coming out next week, <laughs> like this used to happen. I don't know how it, I yeah. guess it doesn't happen anymore, but a trailer would come up and it's like doomsday and then it's opening like a week from now. I'm like, how did we not hear, heard about this? Let's go see it. And just the thrill of seeing a movie that we knew nothing about. Uh, and that's a good one to go in cold because it goes, it, it has like, it goes all over the place. 
all over the place. It's hard to justify the number of genres that are tucked into this movie. Uh, but it's relentless. And, and I got to admit, I totally enjoyed the experience because, you, you, you know, again, you're with a friend and you turn over and you turn and uh, look at your friend next to you and go, did that just happen? Did, did this seriously go where I think it's going? So See, that's how I, I felt with the Book of Eli, because mm-hmm. I watched that completely cold, watched it on a plane. I was like, this is probably going to be incredibly shit. And then I watch it. And you can clearly see they know it's not Shakespeare. They don't mm-hmm. think it's the best movie ever, but they're like, all right, we've got a dystopian landscape. We're going to do a basic dystopian story. We've got a black bloke with a Bible. That's kind of weird, I guess. Don't know why we did it. We've got the first actor who agreed. Let's put Tom Waits in it. Why not? And Tom Waits is just <laughs> in it. He's like, I run a yeah. shop. Uh, <laughs> I got this book. Oh. And then Gary Oldman runs in and he's angry. It's just a silly film that's so enjoyable. To the same level, I th- I loved Mad Max and all, but I enjoyed it exactly the same amount as yeah. Book of Eli. Because, and that's another one, that because I really think you've got online hype and offline hype. There are some mm-hmm. movies like Donnie Darko, I think, transcends both. Mm-hmm. Because it's his own. But then you've got movies like No Country for Old Men. Again, I feel like that is very much the offline hype, though everyone seems to love it, and I think it's god-awful. But Mm -hmm. it's weird how you've got these films where online pumps it up way more than offline, or they pump up the hate. Like I've met a lot of people offline who quite enjoyed um, Suicide Squad. Really good example. Mm -hmm. They really enjoyed it. Everyone online thinks it's the worst thing ever, blah, blah, blah. Conversely, I've met a ton of people online who love Team America. Uh-huh. And everyone bloody hates it. Girl on the <laughs> team, online people love it. Offline people hate it. I don't know if it actually means anything. I'm conflating some theory between things I remember. But it is really No, bizarre. it's possible. I was on a plane like last week and, and the people in front of us were, were in front of me were just going on and on about um I think it was like Grown Up, some Kevin James movie. Oh, that's and it's like, nice. and, it, and it's nothing that like you would ever find online, like chatter, you know, some sort of film Twitter going, the appreciation of, of this particular Adam Sandler, Kevin James vehicle. <laughs> but, you know, you go into the real world and it's like, you know what? It entertained these people enough that they're repeating jokes or talking about it. And it's like, there's something to be said about that. You, you got to think like, part of me thinks like if, if uh, Tommy Boy, if the Chris Farley movies had come out, <laughs> During the age of Twitter, it's like they're I, – I don't know how they would deal with it. Oh, no. Because like we, we all them. love it now, but they would they would be like, what, what is this shit, you know? So – Yeah. There, there's, there's something about like – there's something about not subjecting something to the the, the, the picking of it by, by tweets and just like watching it and just enjoying it on its what it is, you know? I like watching the online fandoms and offline fandoms deal with Wonder Woman. That has been – the most unpleasant. that's interesting yeah 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 because uh that's that's a tough one it's because a- uh, i'll say like you know i i get i get people who loved it because they were looking for something that had they hadn't seen in a movie and i i, I you try to separate that from all the other issues that i particularly had with it i try and separate that from the film itself yeah i know and it's tough but like you know i realized like i don't want to be the guy I don't want to be the, well, actually, you shouldn't like this movie because of these things that it, it completely failed to do because you're completely, you know, just a glow because of something else that you got out of it, right? I actually, But it's, it's tough. But you just said something that I feel really applies, which is the phrase, you shouldn't like this. Yes. I don't, I'm not judging you for it. I'm exactly the type of person to say that almost every day. But... <laughs> I really feel like that is a unique, it's not invented by online, but it's definitely compounded by the world of hell online. So mm. Wonder Woman, I feel like has done well, thanks to the online people who for mm. some reason think a movie about a woman who barely understands anything that's going on and is portrayed as a dipshit throughout who is unable to see anything that's going on in front of her, but is strong. That's all right. that matters. If she's fucking stupid, that's 
fine. <laughs> she's still a feminist. Also, lo- Gal Gadot loves the IDF. Just a side note. But again, you can't apply that necessarily to the movie. You can apply any number of other criticisms, such as it's very clear that they wrote this film for World War II. Then someone went, there's too many World War II movies. Let's make it World War I. And nobody had learned about World War I history. <laughs> I actually think it could be quite good if they did that. But it's that was one where you saw another kind of compounding online where it's like, yeah, hashtag all women are Wonder Woman. Right. It was weird because I don't know what lesson they felt it was teaching. And I think you you touched upon something where it's people felt they did this weird imprinting upon it that it proved something to them. And it made, And I always thought Yeah, no, go on. No, I was just saying it made them feel like they uh, were seeing a better version of humanity when if anything <laughs> You saw a multi-billion-dollar studio monetizing pop feminism <laughs> in a hackneyed and painful way, and it's just—it was weird watching people argue about that. Say, isn't a feminist movie? Or is a feminist movie? And then back to the other version of just it's a bad movie. Well, it's not a bad movie because of what it does, but what has it done? Well, I don't like that you're asking so many questions. So thank you. <laughs> Moving yeah, on. Yeah. And the other thing that's that's odd is um, to, to me, like you said, you know, how, how does the internet deal with it? That's one thing. But I always thought that, uh, you know, I don't know why I still hold print to some standard, but you'd think that print and like professional uh, critics should be above that. Yeah. So I was quite surprised to see Wonder Woman make like top 10 lists. Uh, by the end of that year, because, you know, the, hey, I liked it because it made me feel this should be the bar that you have for an audience member. But as a critic, it feels like, you know, what, what kind of critic are you? Are you really analyzing this film for film's sake? And if so, does that movie really pass that, t- you know, that bar? So I, I was surprised because I think that's what's happening. I think like the, this infiltration of, of that conversation into – because you can't avoid it. And, you yeah. know, these movie critics are online as well. So you know, you, you really can't avoid it. So they, they get swept up to it and, and it makes the year endless. And some of them are buying followers, which makes me not trust them. Really? Now, well, you remember there was that oh, – you clearly don't. Wow, you didn't prepare. Oh, um. <laughs> Roper. I'm sorry, I didn't, What's I didn't his read name? the notes. Richard Roper? Fuck, I don't even Richard know. Richard Roper? Yeah, yeah, I really yeah. talked down to you when I don't remember his name. He apparently <laughs> bought Twitter followers and was briefly suspended from the Tribune. Oh my goodness. For like the lamest thing. He probably had no idea what he was doing. Right. But <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me of when I used to review games. There was this uh-huh. weird sliding scale with anything that people knew was going to be good. And Mm -hmm. that is a very loaded thing where it's they know a movie is going to be good. No, it's going to be bad. No, a game is going to be good. No, it's going to be bad. You can't attack certain properties because everyone knows they're good. And I used to get in trouble quite a lot because I just go, I'm playing this and I am giving the critique. I'm seeing that really regularly with movies now where they're, I don't want to say anything approaching like social justice warriors. But I do fucking hate that there is now a cause behind certain movies which makes them unattackable. And by the way, I just want to separate from anyone who wants to make the fucking vapid, empty, stupid, moronic point of I'm not talking about Black Panther. Black Panther (laughs) did a shit ton of research and a lot of fucking effort put into making Deep cultural references sounds like a beautiful movie where they actually put an effort. Wonder Woman mm-hmm. was a pallid, empty, fucking historically stupid, badly acted, badly written, fucking boring piece of shit. I've not seen <laughs> Black Panther, but I'm judging it now. It's an A. No, that's not true. But I have no, no, no idea how good it is. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, yeah. Woman is a great example of a movie put together specifically to get critics to go, this is feminist, with no fucking effort. Mm-hmm. It's the same way the No Country for Old Men, a movie that I'm sure you probably like, everyone else fucking does. I watched that (laughs) and I'm on my own little island that hates it because I believe it was an empty film that plodded around 
for 300 years. Now everyone's going to use that to attack any other critique I make. But that was one where, <laughs> that was the first time I remember watching a movie, hating it, and no one else agreeing with me. Right. Right. Which no, was- I, I get that. I, 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 well, I didn't hate it. I didn't understand why this was being selected as the Coen brothers. Actually, go-to. Yeah, that movie. Actually, I didn't hate it that I was made to hate it by everyone loving it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, you know, it, it's like, Oh, fi- and it's weird. Cause like to me, like Hudsucker proxy and the big Lebowski oh, yeah. is kind of like what I love about them. And, and I have a feeling that they, f- they might feel they can't do that anymore because they have to do the serious or pseudo serious stuff. It's so bizarre um, because Hudsucker Proxy was deeply serious as well as quite comical. Oh, totally. And that was what was great about it. It had this real soul to it, like really yeah. meaningful characters, unlike No Country for Old Men, which, taking a step back, had some good acting, but it was just, it felt like they were trying to do, it actually felt like the Coen brothers were trying to do Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, except they were mm-hmm. doing it from memory. <laughs> and they'd be drinking. I think it's one of those things where that they went so minimal in certain things, yeah. but then they got praised for that minimalism. And you know, if that's your thing, that's one thing. But you got a sense that a lot of people suddenly decided that minimalism was their thing. Uh, you ever see those? You, you see this thing happen online where people do deconstructed movie posters, right? Yeah, and and they just like here. This is my deconstructed movie poster for The Shining, and they just have like a single piece of clip art of an axe against a door, and it's like the laziest yeah. shit you could do. And people post it like, "Oh my god, that's brilliant!" And it's like it's it's not brilliant. Like there's no there's nothing transformative about it. You just recognize two things and you put it put it together, and it just reminds me of like when confronted with something minimal, you, you may react to your appreciation of the clarity of what you're seeing and then all of a sudden elevate it, add a yeah. bunch of art to it that isn't really there. And you know, you, you get that with the ambiguous ending. It's like you throw in an ambiguous ending and it's either going to frustrate people and that could be, you know, that that's legitimate or people are like, huh, that'll make me think. But to suddenly like jump to your feet and applaud, it always feels like uh, you're, you're putting on the airs of someone who loves ambiguity as if that's like the top, you know, that's, those are, that's what I look for in a movie. So I'd sound really intelligent if I could remember the book, so I don't. <laughs> but I remember reading a book in university about different meanings in film, and I think it was called the synaptic meaning or synoptic meaning, where it was mm. the meaning that was given to the movie by the people watching it. It was not in... Okay. And I feel that something happened around the time of The Matrix which made movies start doing this and people fucking love it because it makes them feel smart. If they can sit right. there and objectively watch a movie and go, Whoa, that means this. And yeah. I'm so smart for going, but this is the meaning it, what it ha- what it does is it allows directors and it allows creators of all different kinds. You see it in various games. Where you get those art house indie shit games. <laughs> and then you get beautiful indie games because they actually make gameplay. But you get these games where, and you get these movies especially, where there's no meaning to it or there's little mm-hmm. meaning. Like the end of Inception is a great example. They, d- people didn't see that as lazy. They saw it as thoughtful and thought provoking. Mm-hmm. I want to think during a movie, but I don't want to have to write the movie. <laughs> yes. And... <laughs> You kind of saw it with the Matrix Revolutions, where it just all the wheels came off, the car went into a bank, and people were like, whoa, that's really fun. And then they hated it not long after because it was such a bad call. And yeah. if you compare, I mean, other Cohen Brothers movie, they did, uh, was it My Brother Where Art Thou? They did, or did they make yeah. that up? So that's another no, great good. movie full of life, full mm-hmm. of thought, full of meaningful almost overacting, mm-hmm. but in a fun way. And I feel like you, you're currently seeing a reaction to the kind of movie making where there's big old holes in it and you have to guess what's in it. You're seeing movies like John Wick and John Wick 2 do very well because people are like, oh, thank Christ, I can just watch a movie again. Right. 
and and you don't you don't feel lost. You're you're grasping onto something, and and yeah, and you. But then you get the flip side. You get the overcompensation of people demanding or or really looking for connectivity and pieces that aren't there. It's like the the sentiment that movies are puzzles that they need to to figure out. And it's like no, you know, that's that's just what it is, kind of thing. So what the people uh, world. <laughs> it's 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 the strangest thing. It's like I I'm not sure. I, I think what's happened is it's always been like this to some degree, but now we have the ability to transmit our inability to process visual storytelling and, and let the world in on on our blind spots. Um, yeah, and then find people of similar blind spots, and we become you know this is what we think this movie should be because I I can't understand it being anything else. And that's something weird I've seen as well. The next version of that is identity and Mm -hmm. media we consume. The movies I I like are the person I am, are the people I am, was what my brain wanted to say. Thank you, brain. Yeah. Enough left poisoning (laughs) for you for one year. But it's this weird thing where I hate this and I love this, which is very human. It's a good way of things you love and hate or who you are. But it's weird that they are, prescribing this level of hate or love to make what they watch and how they like it. And you're now seeing what I thought were ironic things. I brought up Frasier. I love Patty Mo. He's a great tweeter. He talks about Frasier and liking it. And I thought he was joking, but apparently he's 100% seat serious. <laughs> Third row the sun's better. But <laughs> it's weird that just people don't. And I feel that on some level, we're going to get this weird mishmash of people liking things. And people are going to start liking, I'm not saying Frasier is awful. I'm just, I don't love it. But they're going to start right. liking objectively bad things. I guarantee you in the next five years, someone's going to be, one of these irony people is going to be, I love everybody loves Raymond. Something like right. that. <laughs> and, and build and a whole shrine to it. Yeah. And they're going to mean it. And there's going to be a weird following behind it. Because there's this weird identity behind it. And yeah. I still say, though, given the choice, that is probably – like it's not healthy, but no. it's healthier than building your identity about hating something. That's true. Like if, if you changed your uh, Twitter handle to no country for old men sucks and your entire <laughs> online ex- now. <laughs> your entire online existence was to let anyone – whether they asked or not, know that they should stay away from that movie at all costs. Especially the Cohen I, brothers. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. You know, I don't think that's a good way to be. No, I don't. But I, it, it is weird though because you are. Maybe it's better. Maybe I, I actually think you're right. It is a better world if people are inherently tying themselves to things they like, even if it's a weird irony liking. Right now, everyone hates Ready Player One. And I think that Ready Player One is a great example of going way too far down this Yeah, I think so. Because people fucking love references. Oh my yeah, God, yeah. people. People have, and that's not a new thing anyone's saying it is. It's just fucking stupid. Because <laughs> everyone, well, what's great though is I'm going to, I want to keep a list, which definitely is a great way to start hating things. But I keep a list of people who hate something or like something. Nothing bad has ever happened when that happened. But. I want to see who <laughs> hates the Big Bang Theory but loves Ready Player One. Oh, that's got a weird Venn diagram right there. Well, because if it's not a circle, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. The- I do think okay. it, it's funny. Ready Player One, I do think the pendulum has swung too far on the hate. And I, I, you know, I'm not going to go out and defend the movie because I haven't seen it yet. And I totally get where people are coming from. Before I see it and never see it and still hate it. But I'm going to read Wikipedia so that I can create a structured argument. But now I think I think people are 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 just just like hating it because they've gotten used to hating it. Yes, (laughs) you can't back off now. Whereas ordinarily it'd be like, "Eh, it's not for me. I just let it slide. Well, I think Um, it's also this level of people. It's I think there's a core of people who loved being the people who like the internet things and to now yeah. see something so kind of big bang theory bazingo mm-hmm. and all that saying ah i know doctor who or star wars or what have you i know these things now it's popular and they're gonna get pissed off 
it looks like a fucking terrible movie. I'm going to be honest. I actually like <laughs> quarters of the trailer, and then I saw like 18 references, and I realized how much they were desperate, and that's what I kind of like. It just feels desperate. And but I think a lot of these people are just no. This is my insular culture. Yeah, which gets back to the I like I like thing but I don't like it now other people like it. And I know you can't talk much about Star Wars, mm-hmm. but I feel like a lot of that happened with Star Wars. Take It does. Like, it does. I you know, and- have to discuss that, but I feel like there's a lot of resentment, especially with The Force Awakens, in my opinion, not putting that on mm-hmm. you, where people hate it. Oh, it's just like Star Wars again. Okay, fine. But so the, the structure of that film, the repetition, is just like so many movies. You like The Fast yeah. and the Furious. <laughs> yeah, and each one – well, here's the thing. What, what I think is true, and, and I've, I've seen other people talk about this in, in much more uh, in-depth ways, but Star Wars has this weird thing where it feels like the audience that's been with it for the longest time uh, – feels like they really like you know like they slog through a lot of hardship when in reality it's not exactly the hardest thing to like star wars <laughs> you know it's, it's a movie yeah but it, it's sort of people forget how huge or maybe they never lived through it how huge star wars was when it first came out it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't this niche thing and so you get the sense that people now who uh, it, it's becoming huge again and um, they're like, well, this was used to be mine, but it's like it was never yours. It belonged to like the whole world uh, yeah. uh, latched onto this. And I think my um, the thing I laugh at the most is people being like, wow, Disney's really taking Star Wars and milking it for all it's worth cash wise. Like Star Wars was only available at like in the <laughs> places. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't buy any Star Wars merchandise mm-hmm. unless you knew a guy. It was when my brother saw it when Empire came out. I think he saw it. No, he saw Empire in the cinema, my oldest brother. Mm-hmm. And when he, he was there, they had Star Wars merchandise everywhere. It was just yeah, as yeah. Star Wars was. Yeah, it was never this thing that only played the small clubs. You know, yeah. you, had to, you had to know someone to go see a Star Wars movie. It was like they didn't sign on to a major label, you know. It was <laughs> it's like Metallica. That, that, that version of Star Wars never existed, but to yeah. hear some people talk about it, you'd, you'd think that's what they're referring to. It's like, you know, when George Lucas we used to go door to door with his little film projector and he would, uh, he would <laughs> hey, show you this movie. Uh, did you want to watch my movie? Uh, <laughs> yeah, back, well, let's remember those days. It's like, no, I got that, my that Super never I kind of love that it was, idea. It was always a big thing, and it always had tie-ins, and it always had ways to extend the story. Uh, the idea that yeah, it, it always strikes me as funny because the idea that like you know what, what's happening now is milking it. I mean, like as opposed to back in the old days when when you had lightsaber gogurts and yeah, <laughs> when you like, had comics. <laughs> it's like They're all just of that. as many it's Star Wars comics. Perhaps you didn't yeah. have separate separate titles, but you had a ton of comics. And mm-hmm. this, I said Metallica is a joke, but yeah, it's true. They were just as big before the Black Album. They were still pretty popular. But on top of that, I mean, you're seeing these things that people perceive as nerdy, as popular, like yeah. the Marvel movies. People mm-hmm. are acting as if oh, well, they're really, oh, they're going for another Iron Man thing or another Marvel thing. Forgetting the Spider-Man movies, plural, the Batman movies, perhaps they weren't as ridiculously, well, they're not profitable at all, but you get my point. They weren't as fiscally huge, but they were there was just as much merchandise. And, oh, Transformers, now it's just some big Michael Bay thing. It was an incredibly (laughs) successful owned by Hasbro, I believe. Still a yeah. huge, expensive piece of shit when they'd sell a toy around anything. Yeah, it was It was always existed to sell toys. And the idea that it existed for some sort of higher uh, folk art purpose is kind of odd. Well, my thing is always, can't it be both? Yeah, because I think so. I, I always got the feeling that just there was 
very rarely a time in Transformers or Star Wars where it felt like, all right, can't really get into detail here, but for the most part, it doesn't feel like things have been invented just for selling a toy. And back then, yeah. all right, Ananananananan or whatever he's called, it was a return yeah. to Jedi toy for him. I believe he went quite high on the market, but point I'm making is why the fuck do we need a toy for him? It's right. not like they made it. Jim Henson was like, oh, this will sell for a lot of them. We'll make this much. Sure, things might be more mediated now and they might have more spreadsheets, but I don't feel like they were less capitalistic back then. Oh, yeah. Disney or who, or I guess Lucasfilm was mm-hmm. less, they didn't like money as much as Disney. It's just complete nonsense. It's a weird, it's not even nostalgia. Right. Because it never changed. Yeah, but it has changed. Like it, it, it's changed in their mind, and yeah. it's changed in their mind because because there are new people getting latched onto this thing. Where again, they feel defensive. This, this used to be mine. It used to be mine and only mine. It's like, well, that was never the case. Yeah, there is this weird ownership of media. I feel that it's well getting back to the hell of Twitter that we all stick our heads in every day just to stab our brains with knives. But sure. thought about quitting Twitter, by the way. No, I'm kidding. But it's <laughs> every getting, day. Every day. Maybe every tomorrow. Day. <laughs> but like somebody. But now people are I feel that Twitter has people are oh yeah, identity politics. We make fun of that. Or there are people doing identity politics. Twitter is just it's turning it into this weird thing of identity politics is every day. But I don't mean anything to do with actual rights or people's right to live. I mean, just, I like thing. What did you say, you piece of shit? I will kill you. I love that movie. Did you like that song? Fuck you. You're terrible. You have AIDS. Weird, yeah. like, crazy reactions to benign or not benign things. Well, and it's the weird thing because it's like, you know, you could it, let me just be like, try to be impartial. And on the flip side, yeah, should I say, well, if someone comes in and praises something that you like, is that the cost of having that unsolicited? Is the cost of that means you just have to deal with people who don't like it? And I'm like, well, no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. Um, it's the weirdest thing because, like, as as we've alluded, I, I am involved in Star Wars, and that's that's an absolute reality. And that does occupy a lot of my Twitter. But a lot of times I've got nothing, I've got nothing to say about the job when I'm on Twitter. I, I'm, I'm following the same meatheads everyone's following uh, and, and having fun and, and getting involved in, in ridiculous uh, you know, drill-level conversations and absurdity. Uh, but then there's always tons of people who want to pile onto those threads and, and ask Star Wars stuff. Like I always feel bad when I retweet something completely non-Star Wars related that someone funny on Twitter has said, and then, or I respond to it. And then, a you know, a bunch of uh, Star Wars fans and, and nothing against them, but it's like, <laughs> read the room. They kind of pile onto that thread. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, sorry. I just, sorry, Mo boot. I just invited a bunch of Star Wars fans <laughs> into your, into yeah. your rant about something because I liked it. You tweet so. Judd Bungo fuck. And now a bunch <laughs> of people are asking, whether Ray is Obi Wan's kid, <laughs> it, so you just have to bizarre. remember. Like I, I always have to remember that I have an entire like school bus of 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 fans who, and I get it because they're excited, they want to talk about it. But uh, I always have to remember that they're 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 not far, and I and you have to watch yourself with the kind of circles that you end up online. But at I the same it, time, I don't want to self I don't want to self police what it is I'm interested in and my, you know, my my horrible leftist propaganda that I'll that I'll tweet on from time to time. So Yeah, I think that there's I alluded to this with Vincent as well. I know I should shut the fuck up about that guy. It's gone. Now. <laughs> but we're talking about how there is a certain ownership and there is a certain Maybe ownership's not the right thing. People feel they are owed something by you, by Mm -hmm. virtue of you being online. You have opened yourself up, and they think they are owed something. And as a result, I sometimes see it with you when it's just people will ask you a really specific Star Wars thing, 
And in their mm-hmm. heads, I can imagine they're thinking, well, he's online, he's on Twitter, and he's talking to people. So he's going to tell me the secrets of the next billion dollar movie. Sure. He's just going to tell me that because that's what we do here. And I do feel there were just no barriers set with Twitter. There's nothing established. And that anyone who opens that door even a little right. is ready. And it's See, just but, like, there, but there, there's degrees. So if there's some level, I don't mind that. If you, if you yeah. create a brand new tweet to ask me a question, great. But if you add on to a thread or a conversation about like, uh, you know, you know, like if I've started a thread about circumcision or something and then you jump in and ask about X-wing space speeds or something, I'm like, um, I'm kind of in the middle of something here, you know? Yeah, dude. Ask me about whether, <laughs> X, whether Biggs was weird Antilles cut or not. <laughs> then I will help because that's on there topic. There you go. Stay on topic, exactly. I, stay on target, loosen up. But <laughs> it's it's funny that there is a certain cachet to things you say. And I guess, especially with Disney, big company, probably most people are not that open. You having any level of openness, it's not like you open the door and say, I'm going to give the secrets. Right. Probably a bloke on your, on your roof will shoot you if you do that. But... It's bizarre how much people expect. And even I've had mates of mine go, oh, you know, Pablo, right? You can uh, get some of that secret Star Wars stuff. <laughs> and I've said to them, what the fuck secret Star Wars thing? I'm going to get the real of Solo. I'm going to get the secret shots where you can check out Donald Glover's cock. Like, what am I going like, to find out? It's, just, it's not like I'm married to them. No, I know. And it, and it's like, first of all, it's like I've been here, I've been at the company for 18 years. I, I know yeah. how to be online and what to say and what not to say. I started off in the online division here. So it, the idea that I am going to blow the ending of a movie on my Twitter account, is kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, but at the same time, like people also then think the flip side is that, you know, I do have an armed guard standing behind me yeah. ready to delete whatever I'm going to post. And, and they're very hands off as long as you exhibit some degree of uh, of basic normal human behavior online. They're not gonna uh, they're not gonna draconianly that's not a word uh, police yeah, yeah. everything you do. You know, it's it's weird that it all comes back. And I feel like the scam is just every episode going to come back to how weird and bad Twitter is. But I don't think I've ever seen an online phenomenon because when it came to forums, there was no verification. There was no, yeah. there was no call for most people to be on a forum. Maybe Reddit, but even then, there is something about the immediacy of Twitter that creates a very special mind poison <laughs> where people just assume certain things that... You've said this on Twitter, and thus it means these eight other things. Back to over over reading into things, I guess. Right. And it's really weird. And you see, I, I will occasionally get asked, like, oh well, you know Felix, and Felix said this. And I'll be and genuinely, when that last happened, I just said to the person, Do you think I am Felix? Right. Just am I yeah, I am. I could, he can bench me, but I'm Felix, and <laughs> I'm not his carer. He doesn't run his fucking tweets by me. And I'm like, well, you know him well. It's like, but the right, like, if I know him well, still, do you think that I am able to go? Oh yeah, well, Felix, I need to uh, petition you to remove that tweet. My wife makes posts on Facebook. I don't run them fucking by me. I'm right. not like, honey, please don't discuss this subject. For fear that easy PR will come under some fucking <laughs> military occupation. And I just think that people, because of the immediacy of today's online in general, because people do it with Instagram, people do it with Facebook, Snapchat, what have you, there is this belief that this immediacy means a, di- a more direct connection than there is. And it's dangerous and scary. Yeah. It's, it's what makes the whole network interesting. I don't think you and I would have ever spoken without Twitter. And that's what makes yeah, it enough. great. But then yeah. you've got the other side where you've got guys that just create an account to say the N word. 
just that's why they did it. That's the that's the it's a Tuesday time to say that word, and they do that, and it's I don't know what it is. It sh- if they were smarter, they'd make way more money, but they haven't worked out how to even control it. Right? You mean Twitter? Get, yeah, going to get weirder. I it, yeah. I mean, they they Jack recently said like, okay, it's I we admit there's something not right with Twitter. <laughs> You don't he said, say. help me understand what's bad. <laughs> so I'm just like, my account is the good start. Like, but it's like, what's bad here? Hmm. <laughs> Could be it's anything. Ver- ver- verified Nazis is probably a good place to start. There's just, but, there's just Nazis in general. Well, <laughs> and if we, if we ban the Nazis, isn't that not freedom of speech? We already delete things so it's never going to be freedom right. of speech it's this yeah. people trying to be philosopher kings that are not that smart it's a good way to describe twitter in general <laughs> i think so yeah i think that's in a nutshell <laughs> oh, i think that's actually a good point to wrap up on thank you so much right. for coming on always a pleasure ed and uh, we'll have to uh, get together for a beer sometime let's have another beer exactly one beer and dial 911 this has been the yeah. scumbag I'm Ed Sitch, and this is The Scumbag Podcast Season 2, a wonderful rumination on online. Thank you so much for listening.